G, a very special treat, Mr. 305, Mr. Worldwide himself, Pitbull. Take your life from a negative to a... He not working hard. Yeah, right, picture that with a Kodak. I'm a person that's been very, very blessed to be able to create something from nothing. I took my life from negative to positive. I would put things in music, and I could not believe that they would come to life. I'm like, oh, this really works. That's right. My family, I'm first generation Cuban American, and I know what they went through in order for me to enjoy freedom. I didn't graduate from high school, but it was a teacher that changed my life. One day I was rapping in the hallways, and she thought it was a fight. And she said, you got talent. And that's all it took. I never set my mind to be the best rapper. I'm a hard worker. My first major concert looks like, hey, get this mother off stage right now. <laughs> you don't make mistakes, mistakes make you. The more I heard no, the more I was like, I gotta fight for this, I believe in this. I tell people all the time, there's no losing, only learning. No failure, only opportunities. And there's no problems, only solutions. And the word can't is can. And the word don't is do. And if you take impossible and put an apostrophe right there, it makes it impossible. Nothing's gonna stop us now. You know, we live in a society that's so connected, it's disconnected. People taking so many pictures, they're missing the big picture. I don't care about followers, I don't care about likes, I don't care about views. Be a leader, be unique, be different, and make a difference. Music allowed me to be able to build schools in one of my own neighborhoods and now all over the United States of America. It means the world to me because you see these kids and you see you. We all bleed the same blood, breathe the same air, and put our pants on one leg at a time. In the same way that music is a universal language, I also see NASCAR as a universal language. We're gonna bring everybody together within the track house partnership. Once you figure out you're possible, you can break through any barrier, any border, there's no limits, and you live life how you want to live. There is no secret sauce. You work hard, and it will pay you back. I promise you. For everybody out there, I tell them, hey, why dream when you can live it? So get on it. <laughs> Pac said, I'm not the one that's going to change the world, but I'm the one that's going to spark the mind of the one that is going to change the world. And that's what I'm looking at here today. Ground is up. Remember that. Yeah. Oh man. Amanda, can you believe this? Ah man. I mean, I mean, it's, it's like absolutely unbelievable. And we want to start off by saying thank you to everybody here for believing in us. Thank you, Manny, for believing in me and Melissa as well. And it just goes to show you history in the making. This is truly, I would say, a field of dreams. If you build it. They will come, so we appreciate you more than you know. Thank you so much. I got to tell you, uh, sit down, sit down. Melissa and I, um, basically, when we were just at the very beginning, it was just an idea, and I talked to Melissa about it, and I said, you know, we really need somebody to give this the name, the credibility. It didn't even have a name yet. It was not called Emerge. And then through a friend of mine, uh, we were introduced to Armando. I remember today, uh, you know, Meetings with Armando, I've learned through the years, are really, really uh, hard work <laughs> in the sense that we met with him for the first time. I think it was around 2 p.m. at Grove Isle, yes, and Melissa and I were there. And then about midnight, <laughs> that same day, you know, we basically had a partner. And I don't mean a partner in the sense of, you know, financial. This guy, actually, he said, I, you had me on hello. It's the truth. It's the truth. The minute that anybody, you know, for one, I, I say it again, thank you, Manny and Melissa, for believing in me to be a partner in Emerge. Anything that has to do with us growing, building Miami and its reputation, you could count me in. So when Manny came over to the spot that I was at, where we call it the, we call it the Bat Cave, the Bat Cave. <laughs> he said, I want to, we want to create a platform, a home for technology and allow Latin America to be able to have the same opportunity that everybody else has at Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, Silicon Paradise. And not only is it an honor to be up here with you, but it's 10 years later us having this conversation and there's been over a thousand companies that have come through the platform and have raised $2.5 billion. And that's the same companies that nobody would give a chance to, nobody would give an opportunity to. And me and Manny both know, or all of us do know, being Miami underdogs, what it is when nobody believes in you. You can either let that fire or that fuel burn you out, or you can utilize that fuel 
and that fire to say, and excuse my French, fuck that shit, we gonna make this happen. Yeah. <laughs> so. And that's what we've done in technology, so thank y'all once again, we appreciate you. <laughs> so, I mean, and this is really what I love about Miami. Obviously, you know, Armando has become a, not only a close friend, but we just really is somebody that I truly admire. Uh, so what happened was, I mean, he has, if you see, if you saw his forearm, he has 305 tattooed here, basically. I mean, he is the original 305. He believes in this community. And it took him a nanosecond to understand the magnitude of what this could be. And basically, he went all in. He went all in with his time. It's the most important time. At the very beginning, when nobody even knew, we had a bunch of, uh, we had a meeting at 8.30 in the morning in Coral Gables. This is even before Emerge happened. And then uh, I didn't really know him that well. So he said, I'm going to be there. And I'm, because we had a bunch of people. I didn't say anything. I said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, Melissa says to me, he's here. And at the very beginning, at 8.30 in the morning, not even knowing he's there. So he gave us this. I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating this. Uh, this would not have been possible without Armando's very much dedication from day Thank one because it gave, us the, it gave us the credibility that we needed at the, at the very beginning. So anyways, enough about romance. Let's talk, uh, let's talk about sex. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, tell me, Amanda, one of the things that I admire about this guy is that first of all, he doesn't stop. And second of all, he's one of the most creative individuals. So over the last 10 years, I know you are all over the place in a good way, meaning you really, I mean, you're leaving for Vegas tonight, you have a show in Vegas tomorrow, you have your concerts, you have everything that is going on. But specifically, as you say, as in, in your video, when everybody says that he was a teacher, even though you didn't graduate from high school, he was a teacher that actually set you in the right place, that sparked that giving back on education and to kids. You founded SLAM. SLAM was just a very beginning. Can you bring us up to date? Tell everybody what SLAM is and where SLAM has gone from, the, from then to now. Well, first of all, I didn't you co-founded SLAM. We have Fernando Solueta here and the whole team and, uh, who gave us the opportunity to be able to build schools. Who believed in me, by the way, who said, you know, someone that didn't graduate high school went to a lot of different schools, about 20, maybe 25, depending how you count them. Good neighborhoods, bad neighborhoods, worse neighborhoods, ugly neighborhoods. But it built a lot of character. And when I tell you that, yeah, I didn't graduate high school, but a teacher changed my life, and all she looked at me and said is, I believe in you, you got talent. Now, ironically, I was hopeless at the time. I was on a different trajectory in life, but it was a teacher named Hope, ironically, who gave me hope. And her name is Hope Martinez. Now, that led to, I would always go and speak to schools everywhere I was at, different neighborhoods I was living in, and when I was coming up in, in the music business, in the, early, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I would go to speak to different schools. I happened to be at one of Fernando's schools in Hialeah. And he saw me speaking to a Hialeah, Agua Fango Factoria. Perfecto, there it is. <laughs> and when I went to go speak to the kids, Fernando saw what I had going on and we had a good friend mutually who put us together and said, y'all gonna build a school together one day. So fast forward, we did SLAM. It's been up for 10 years now, which stands for Sports Leadership, Arts, and Management. The reason that I got involved, because that teacher changed my life, and I feel that we can help and give these kids who they don't give an opportunity to, an opportunity just to be able to tell them, not only do I relate to you, we believe in you. So SLAM is now a graduating at 100%. It's an A school. It's been up for 10 years. Come on. <laughs> it's a public charter school, so 97% of these kids are the ones that need it the most. And now we're up to 12 schools, 10,000 kids around the United States of America. And it goes exactly why, thank you so much, I appreciate it, but it goes to show exactly why we're having this conversation here today, is 10 years ago when we had this conversation about Emerge and what it was to be able to help those that need it the most, not only can you count us in, but we're going to go out there and fight for you and create you know, these opportunities, and, and again, it's a blessing to be up here. So SLAM is something that runs parallel to emerge from the tech side of things where we're involved. Anything that moves in technology, we try to be ahead of the curve with as well. And obviously we know what artificial intelligence is doing now and what quantum is doing now. And, and uh, it's funny because I say there's two AIs. 
There's artificial intelligence, and then there's Armando intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I know which one I'll take. <laughs> <laughs> but with that said, is that's how we bring this all together because we start with an idea that nobody really believes in and all we do is we go for it. And we don't really let, let too many people know about what we got going on because by the time they try to figure it out and maybe stop us, but we already did it. Talking about AI, if we had an app that could actually quantify the impact, both financial and otherwise, that you've had on those 10,000 kids and all the thousands that have graduated, it's almost immeasurable, right? And that basically is, I mean, the sense of satisfaction that it gives you and knowing you is beyond anything that you could possibly think. I mean, it's priceless. You know, you, you saw it in the reel that you just played, but that's one of the lines that I've always taken from Tupac. May he rest in peace, but he said, I'm not the mind that's gonna change the world, but I'm the mind that's gonna spark the mind that's going to change the world. And when I say I, I mean we, I mean us. I don't do this by myself. It's a phenomenal team, phenomenal partners who have the same vision, same goal, same focus. And bottom line is to be able to do it in a time that, you know, the times that we're living in right now, I feel like the fake gets celebrated and the real get hated. Yeah, we... And it's hard to do real things without anybody trying to knock it down or write a headline. Like they say, if it bleeds, it leads. If it bleeds, it reads. <laughs> it, so I'm the ultimate, and again, we are the ultimate, uh, negative to positive. You know, that kind of things that fuel our fire. So to see this room full like this today, 10 years later, and emerge and have all these amazing companies come through, raise two and a half billion dollars, and change lives, priceless, like I said before. Y muchas gracias, de verdad, que es un honor. Thank you. So I want to give, uh, I want to give everybody here a, a, an idea of the scope of Armando Christian Perez, right? We started with Slam because I honestly believe in his heart, this is the most important, one of the most important things he's done in life. But talking about other business endeavors, so all of a sudden, Armando's become a big deal in NASCAR, basically, and car racing, and his team is like, I don't know, one of the top teams. So tell us a little bit about your NASCAR adventure, basically. All right, so music, universal language, it brings everybody together, it unites, it doesn't divide. Education, universal language, it unites, it doesn't divide. And when it came to NASCAR and the team Trackhouse, when you look at cars and speed and things of that nature, it unites, it doesn't divide. It's, it's another universal language. That's the way I looked at it. And then I fell in love with NASCAR's story. NASCAR's story is they started with bootlegging and moonshining. So it's an ultimate negative to a positive. Growing up in Miami in the 80s, and I in La Pequeña Habana, I'm fifth and fifth, con todos los marielitos. It's an ultimate negative to a positive. You know, we grew up around a lot of entrepreneurs at the time, by the way. They were looking for angel investors and seed money and, and venture capitalists and a way to exit. Different seed Different money, product. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different product. But same mentality, you know, same hustle. So you learn a lot from that. So it's the same way I looked at Trackhouse and, and, uh, and NASCAR. I looked at it as an amazing opportunity. And the two owners that were coming in to represent for the minority cultures, per se, was myself and Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is someone I look up to, I idolize, and a role model throughout my life, and I've found a way to apply a lot of his philosophies, let's just say. So I was like, but como dice Willy Chirino, lo que está para ti, pam, pam, nadie te lo quita. And I was like, well, it's a great time to get involved. And not only did we get involved, we have an amazing team called Track House with Daniel Suarez, number 99, Charles Ch uh, Ross Chastain, number one. And um, we've made an impact. And NASCAR has been an amazing partnership and family. But they now see a different culture showing up to the races and how it's opened the doors to create opportunities for our communities who never really understood what NASCAR is. So now you create something where they can become a part of the pit crew, they can be a part of the, they can be engineers, they can be broadcasters, they can be drivers, they can be owners, they can be agents, managers, in a new world that they had nothing to do with. And I'm gonna rewind a little bit. When I really saw it, Manny, was one day we parked the NASCAR outside of Slam 10 years ago, crazy enough, and when I saw those kids look at that NASCAR, like if it was a spaceship, and they were just asking all kinds of questions about it. I said, here is an opportunity to open the door and an avenue for our culture to get involved with an amazing, um, an amazing sport and at another level, an amazing business. Fantastic. Come on. I mean, 
listen to that. We got to right? get you out to a NASCAR uh, yeah, race. This is like, a, let's let's talk a little bit about your 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 main business, not your your main business, which is music, right? I know you're about to release a new album, right? Actually, we just released one. We're working on another one now. Another we released now. Track House Daytona 500 with uh, the record that's doing amazing for us is with Dolly Parton. Right, so I wanted to tell five. you, tell, me, tell, tell us a little bit about recording with Dolly Parton. You were telling me, tell me a little bit about her and you know, how, you, how you now have a new love in your life. Oh, man. <laughs> Dolly is the real deal. And then it's funny because it's Dolly and Dolly. <laughs> it makes sense. And what I love about Dolly, she's also very low-key. She's very, like I said, she's the real deal. And when we were going to have our first conversation, she's like, look, I only speak on landlines, so you're going to have to call me at this spot. And I was like, oh, I really like Dolly. So we kind of missed each other, but when we did get on the phone, she said, is this my future boyfriend who stood me up on my first phone call? I said, oh, I really like Dolly. So when we got together and I asked her permission if I could re-record 9 to 5, she gave me her blessings. And not only did she record it, she rapped on the record, wow, which crazy. is crazy. And she, obviously she's an, a phenomenal writer. And when I got a chance to hang out with her in, in Tennessee, in Nashville, which is called Cashville now, because it's <laughs> booming, and Dolly was like, well, you know, I want, I want you to let the whole world know now that I'm officially Miss Worldwide. <laughs> And any time you hit the stage, you let them know that from Dolly, I say, oh, well, hey. So from Dolly, oh, well, hey. <laughs> Tell them how, they, how she came up with a 9 to 5. I thought, I thought that was a great thing. So when I got inspired to do the record 9 to 5, I was watching a documentary from Dolly Parton, who I love documentaries. And she was in the trailer f when, when she was doing the movie uh, in the early 80s, uh, which is um, when she did the 9 to 5 record 4. And while she was waiting in the trailer, she started playing with her nails. And that's how she came up with the lyrics to the song. So if you listen to the beginning of the record, that's Dolly Parton's nails going. And it just goes to show you that at, at, at any level, whether it be small, complicated, simple, or genius, it is genius how a creative mind can put something together and have such a powerful record. So to all the powerful women, Dolly Parton says, thank you. How do you, so uh, do I. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. A little bit more um, uh, boring. So how do you think this, there's been a lot of AI fever that emerged this year? Right? And obviously, I believe, with the right uh, reason. And so how, how is this affecting, again, talking about the music industry? How, is it a, how are you using it? Are you concerned? Is it you know, copyrights? Is it, you know, is it easier? Is it more difficult? What is, what is, it, what is it doing to your world? Well, I mean, like anything, you know, the music industry slash music business is always dealing with something new. So whether it's bootlegging the CDs and then it went on to now it's, you know, now it's streaming. It's always something that we've had to figure out how to pivot. OK, but like they say, in crisis, there's opportunity. AI is something that if you utilize it, you don't let it use you, then it can be something very powerful for you. Example, for producers, anybody that's trying to pitch me an idea, they can send me a record with me on it, never getting on it, but either or. I can really see what they're thinking about and where they're going with it. When I first heard it, was it a little interesting? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh shit, that's me, you know? <laughs> so should there be rules, regulations, laws, and protection? Absolutely. But is it a tool that we can utilize to be able to really enhance what it is to collaborate as artists? I think it's going to be a lot of fun, but again, like everything, it, it all depends on how they, hmm. I'm gonna use these words. If they take artificial intelligence and they manipulate things with it, big trouble, big problem. If they take artificial intelligence and they find ways to maneuver and navigate things with it, Good. then it becomes a different kind of tool, yeah. So we've been investing in artificial intelligence and uh, obviously a few of the startups that we've looked at, actually one that we invested in creates your twin basically creates a twin of you, and uh, et cetera. And I was wondering, are you afraid that your twin is actually going to rap and dance better than you are? Actually, that'd be great, because then he can go and make all the money, and I can just hang out in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that, would well, never, that would never happen. That would never happen. Never in a million years. <laughs> so basically. 
Nah, I think, look, it's exactly what it is, artificial intelligence. And you're not going to outdo the real deal, but there should be, like I said before, rules, laws, regulations, and some kind of protection in place, which I know that they're fighting for, because that's why they had the, the strike in Hollywood with the writers, and in music as well, they're setting up certain ba uh, boundaries and, and barriers. But it's something new, so all we can do is sit back, watch, let the dust settle, and learn. I was um, incredibly uh, uh, pleased to talking to Destiny, your daughter, back there. I mean, actually, I hadn't seen her in a little while, and how she's gone and now become part of the business, right, basically. I mean, Melissa's here with our next generation. All the kids are here. You know, we want them, you know, to follow on. And obviously, so tell me a little bit about what kind of a feeling having Destiny with you and in the business and, and uh, is doing. Well, first of all, you know what? I always say that Melissa Medina is the pit bull in a skirt. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She don't play no games. Like we used to say back in the neighborhood, if you think it's a game, play with it. <laughs> so to be able to have someone such as, or, or the relationship that you have with your daughter, to be able to see it and take pieces of it and apply it with the relationship that I have with, with my daughter and, and, and the kids, it's uh, priceless for one. But for two, you know, I deal with this thing, which I've grown up around a lot of drugs, being in, you know, growing up in Miami. Miami went from the, you know, Cocaine capital, now it's the tech capital, let's just say, right? One of the neighborhoods I lived in was Wynwood. It went from the heroin capital to the art mecca at this point. I'll tell you that why. Coke, heroin, crack, very addictive drugs. But fame is the most addicting drug that I've run into in my lifetime. So to have to navigate those waters with my daughter, someone that I love with everything that I got, my kids, something that I love with everything that I got. And what do we do when we love something? We protect it. And in this world of social media, it's hard to do. So I've taught them how to move, literally, like 007 agents. And when they ask them who their father is, we have all little funny stories and things like that because some people think they know. So, you know, we leave it to their imagination. Before, when they were little kids, I used to tell them, hey, when they ask you, what does your father do, tell them that I'm a gynecologist. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to go. used to have a ball with that, you know. <sighs> and it was our little joke between ourselves. But where I'm going with it is that I don't ever want what we've accomplished in life, because they're going to be bigger, better, stronger than I've ever been, to be honest with you. But I don't want them to have to outdo what we've pulled off. I don't want her living in my, I don't want them living in my shadow, right? So what do we do? We find ways to introduce them. Obviously, you know them because you're very close to me. But other than that, we'll work a room away from each other and not let people know what our relationship, what our relationship is. That way we can really see who is who, what is what, and what are people's true intentions, true colors. And most of them have a hidden agenda, especially when they figure it out. So to me, that's the funnest part of watching her grow in business, watching her grow in life, is walking into a room and go, I think I already know who we got to look out for at this point, which we all know is a great tool to have in business because it gives you that intuition. Uh, congrats, you know? congrats. No, muchas gracias. Y gracias a Dios que se puede. Y I'm very proud of them all. So we have only a few minutes left, so I want to make sure that uh, we kind of talk about the future, right? So here, are, we're going to be here 10 years from now, God willing. You and know it. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff uh, again. Uh, what, are, what are we going to be talking about? What, what, what do you think the next 10 years kind of uh, bring? What are, what are you looking at, uh, whether business or music or what? You know, I mean, there's so many game. things that are going on right now in technology, and the, the world is moving so fast. You know, what I'm really hoping is that with all this technology that's being implemented, it's, I want you to think about it as, you know, kids at this point, because that's really what it's about, right? The next generation, the future, and these kids. Kids have... Uh, have always had certain rules and regulations in place. Let's say 16 years old is when you're able to drive. 18 year olds when you're able to smoke. 21 is when you're able to drink. Let's just utilize that as an example. I feel that in the future what there should be is more, which DeSantis just passed a law here in Florida that kids can't use social media until they turn 14 years old. Things of that nature is what I feel should be more in the future. Because if you have a bunch of people, just hypothetically, let's speak about, if you take technology and you somehow, some way, compare it to driving, right? When you drive, there's lanes, there's stop signs, there's stoplights, there's things that keep things in order. Because not everybody just be running into each other and crashing all day. And I feel like that's what's happened with social media as they're trying to get their hands on it. And thank you, by the way. And, 
as long as we learn from social media to apply it to artificial intelligence, that's the part that I'm, I really want to be a part of, which we are a part of artificial intelligence from a preventative standpoint with things that will help keep schools safe, which we'll talk about that another day. But where I'm going with it is, look, last thing we want is a society where the cars get smarter, the phone gets smarter, the refrigerator gets smarter, the speaker gets smarter, the TV gets smarter, and we get dumber. <laughs> That's good. We don't want that. Right. So now it's all about teaching the next generation, again, how to utilize technology, not let it use you. And that, to me, would be uh, ideal in the future. Ten years from now, are we here having this conversation? Absolutely. Are we going to continue to keep growing, breaking down barriers, and opening borders for those that are trying to take their life to the next, I would say, level, but more than anything, just for a little slice of the American pie and live the American dream? We're here to help and facilitate with that. And that, again, it's an honor and a blessing to be on the stage with you 10 years later. Thank you, Amanda. No, we no, thank you, brother. We couldn't have done it without you. You had, you said it. I had you at hello. You had me hello. Hello. And you know, and this guy is just an amazing, the, the, the original 305, the only 305. He really bleeds Miami. We're all so proud of him, and we're proud of our association, our partnership. And obviously, we couldn't be here without, we would never have been here without you. So let's join me in a big round of applause to Mr. 305. Thank you. I appreciate it, Manny. Thank you for the opportunity. Life.